Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin. Wa la aqibatu lil muttaqin wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin sayyidina wa habibina wa syafiina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain. Allahumma la ilma illa ma 'allamtana innaka antal alimul hakim. Allahumma la ilma illa ma 'allamtana innaka antal alimul hakim. Allahumma la ilma illa ma 'allamtana innaka antal alim. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ali kasari. Al-Madid Al-Kajali, wajma'ni bihi fi kulli al-Qawari wa ala alihi wa sahbihi, ya Nur, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, we're continuing on to look at some of the qualities of those who Allah chooses, those who Allah places in his service. Um, one of the aspects that we're going to mention today, before we go into, before we continue on with what we were looking at, is the importance of time, and the importance of taking baraka with time. Um, why is this apt? Because we're on the verge of entering into the month of Rajab, which of course is one of the holy months of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we know, one of the secrets of the believer is that he exposes himself to the nafahat or rahman He exposes himself to the breezes that the merciful sends down. And through these breezes of time, yeah, through these blessings of certain times, openings occur. We're able to enter into states or be able to establish practices and establish ibadah, worship of Allah within ourselves that will not be possible at other times. So one of the things that they say the ulama across the world will mention is that just before Rajab enters, this is the time to prepare for Ramadan. That our preparation for Ramadan is too late. You know, like you have these um, like preparing for Ramadan events. When do they take place? They take place like maybe a week before Ramadan starts in Sha'ban. That's about two months too late. They should be taking place now. This is the time right now to do the preparing for Ramadan events. So we enter into it because the Rajab is the beginning. And Rajab is the great month of Tawbah. It's the great month of turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is why we were created. And it's the entire purpose of the religion of Islam is to turn back to Allah. As we mentioned previously, the angels who were created are beings who worship Allah. And their outer worship is far greater than ours. Far greater. Like we mentioned, there's angels from the beginning of time up until now. They've spent their entire life in sujood to Allah. Their entire life in ruku to Allah. Their entire life standing before Allah, reciting the Quran. Their entire life in, in zikr, in subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wa allahu akbar. But the human being is greater than that, such that the angels were commanded to bow down to the human being. So what is the secret of humanity? The secret of humanity is the ability to turn back to Allah. The ability to improve. Allah seeks from us improvement. It is the ascension, increase. This is what Allah seeks from us above and beyond everything else. And this month of Rajab is a great opportunity for that. To turn back to Allah with yearning and longing in our hearts to be close to Him. From the day that, that before we were even entered into this world, when we took the covenant with Allah, Allah subhi rabbikum, am I not your Lord, bala shahidna. From that day, there's been created within the soul a yearning to return back. And then we've been cast into this dark, disturbing world, far from the, the nafahat of the Rahman, far from the, the breezes of the, of the merciful. Uh, unless we expose ourselves to them, far, far from them. So the, the soul naturally yearns to return back to that world. And this is why Rajab gives us an opportunity to turn back. And Tawbah, as we know, is based upon conditions. The first condition being what? That we have regret, Nadam, the most important condition. That we have regret for what we've done in the past, for sins, shortcomings, deficiencies. Everything in the past, we have deep regret in our hearts. And we should feel that pain within our hearts when we turn to Allah, when we're speaking directly with Allah, when we have our munajat, our intimate discourse with the divine. And how is it that we are able to have an intimate discourse with Allah? How do we deserve that as human beings? How do we deserve to even enter into a month like Rajab? What is it that's stopping Allah seizing our lives right now to prevent us from entering into, the, into that blessed month? So what we, the first thing we do if we're taking the month seriously is we make the about everything that we've done, Y'all, I'm sorry for that. Number two, we leave any sin that we're in at the moment. Anything that we're doing presently, we leave it immediately. If you're in the middle of a sin, you stop and, and you prevent that. Number three, 
you make azam, you make determination, you make, you make a resolve or a promise to never return to that sin. And part of that, of course, is you take steps, you take means to make sure you don't return back. So you leave environments. If we are in a situation where we, we're backbiting about people, where we're arguing, where we're lying, we leave those people behind. We tell them, I can't do this anymore. And then if they don't want to carry on with that, we leave them. If you're with people where we're going to talk about inappropriate things, where we're going to use foul language, we leave that. If you're with people where they, we, we feel arrogant or we feel like we're better than other Muslims, we leave those gatherings. Really, like the reality is that a lot of the gatherings that people go to are just increasing us in arrogance. Yeah, what, they, what they, some of our teachers have to call like the CD culture. There's nothing wrong with CD, it's an Arabic word, which is an honor, honorific term, but it's all the CD, CD, and it's all fake. All of it is just fake, and we're just pretending to people that we're not. And that actually means that gathering you enter into is just increasing you in arrogance, yeah? And increasing your real ostentation, yeah? You know, like showing off, you go your thespi out, and you got this out, and you got that out, and, you know, the outer form of religion with no haqiqa, no, no, no reality. So we turn away from, from all of that, and we make commitments. Those three things. And then the fourth condition, if you've wronged someone else, if you've harmed someone else, you have to rectify it. If it's money, we pay the money back. If you've said something bad about someone and it's gone out into the public realm, then we have to tell them. If it hasn't gone into the public realm, there's differences across the madahib. Yeah? And we, various other things yeah, that we do. If, you, if you've stolen, we return back whatever we took, etc. Yeah? Once we do these things, now we enter into a state of purity and we're not able to turn into Allah with longing. That's the basis of our entrance into Rajab. And then beyond that, there's levels. Yeah, we repent from our major sins and our minor sins, which is what we're talking about here when we have regret, etc. Then we repent from things which are disliked. Either the or either the lesser or the greater. It's something that Allah does not, Allah dislikes it, Allah finds it detestable. The Rasul finds it detestable. So therefore, we turn away from that. Then we turn away even from that which is mubah, which is permissible but excessive. And this is now we're getting to higher refinements of, of religion. Those people who desire sanctification, who desire closeness, who desire qurb, closeness and love of Allah, those kind of people will, will do this. They'll go for removing the mubahat from their lives, excessive sleep, excessive food, excessive talk, excessive interactions with people. They'll remove that from their lives so in order to be able to focus upon, upon the divine. That's a high level. And then a higher level of thought, but seen even than that, is to make Tawbah, to repent from every moment of heedlessness, every moment that you forgot Allah, every single moment of iltifat, every moment you turned away from Allah, your inner being, your sir, your secret, the spiritual secret deposited within the soul of every single human being. If that turns away from Allah, we make Tawbah back to him. If we have a fleeting thought away from Allah, we, we, we make a Tawbah back to him. If we have any kind of desire other than Allah, we have any type of love for anything other than Allah, we have any type of feelings or any type of reaction to anything other than Allah, then we turn back to Allah. That's the highest level of Tawbah. So all of these realities, we ask Allah to allow us to realize him in Rajab. Yeah, so that we become people that turn back to him completely, wholeheartedly, iqbalun ilayhi, kamilan. Yeah, that we turn back to him wholeheartedly, completely turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do this, I know that from one of the secrets of this month, um, alongside the secret of Tawbah, is the Great Return, which is the Prophet Sallallahu on the 27th of Rajab, according to the dominant opinion, is the Isra and the Mi'raj. Yeah, but the Prophet Sallallahu he went on this wondrous journey. He went on a journey that took him from Makkah al-Muqarramah to Masjid al-Aqsa. And he then led the Imams in prayer, and then he ascended, and he ascended, and he ascended until he ascended into the presence of the Rahman and he gazed upon it with his naked eye. This great return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which some scholars say is the greatest miracle of the Prophet sallallahu This is his greatest miracle. Yeah, there's differences that generally the ulama, they mentioned four opinions. What's the greatest miracle of the Prophet sallallahu They mentioned four opinions. The dominant one is the Quran. They say the greatest miracle of the Prophet sallallahu is the Quran. Others say the greatest miracle of the Prophet is the Isra and the Mi'raj. It's this ascension unto the divine and the miraculous unseen realms that opened up for him. And the real miracle of the Isra and the Mi'raj is the Prophet 
remain focused on Allah. He remained focused on Allah despite everything that was being opened to him, all of the wonders of the unseen, all of these gifts that were being given to him, and yet he remained focused on Allah. Yeah, that his eye didn't sway, nor did it transgress beyond the bounds. He didn't have any thought or interest or inclination or turning away from anything other than Allah. He was focused upon Allah throughout a journey that would distract the best of hearts. Yeah, a journey where you're seeing things that are beyond comprehension. And yet his focus remains wholeheartedly upon Allah. Yeah, so this, and then some say, no, the greatest miracle of the Prophet is his physical touch. The physical touch of Muhammad is his greatest miracle. And how many, how many have been cured? In, since, since his time and since after his time, like last Imam Abu Sayyidi and many others, how many have been cured by the touch of the Prophet and then some say, no, his greatest miracle is his character. You are above and beyond majestic, tremendous, exalted character. That his greatest miracle are these refined character traits that he came with that transformed the whole world around, the whole cosmos in reality, the entire universe. Yeah, so these are some of the different views. Now we have, this is all, all in relation to Rajab. So inshallah ta'ala, we hope Allah gives us tawfiq in Rajab. We hope inshallah ta'ala, with the tawfiq of Allah, we saw some classes in Rajab. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll have in the evenings, we want to go through the book of Tawbah by Imam Ghazali. Inshallah ta'ala, if Allah gives us the tawfiq to do so. There's a book to Faqir, had the opportunity, alhamdulillah, to study uh, in Morocco with some of the shirk there, with their um, chains that go back to, to Imam Ghazali. And we also looked at it with the great Habib Muhammad Al-Aidurus as well. We were able to study with him. So alhamdulillah, inshallah ta'ala, those asani, those chains of transmission of light, which is all we have to offer. In reality, we have nothing to offer other than our connection to people. We are connected to people. We are connected to people back to the soul. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we hope, inshallah, that you have maybe half an hour just in the evenings for people to come together and to learn about the topic of Tawbah. How do we turn back to Allah? And there's no no one better in explaining that than Imam Ghazali. It really is because he did it himself. He's talking from experience. He's not a fake like 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 people like me. He's not a fake. He's the real deal. And he actually experienced it, and now he's going to tell you how to do it. So when we study Imam Ghazali, he speak, he's speaking to us. Forget about the intermediary, it doesn't matter. Imam Ghazali is speaking to you directly. So inshallah, we can, we can take, take from some of these meanings. There will be more uh, details passed out. But inshallah, we hope to begin at uh, sort of 7.30 till 8.00. Uh, most days of the week, apart from Thursday when you have the Mawlid, outside of that, inshallah, every, every evening we'll have that. Inshallah, we ask Allah for Tawfiq to give us Tawfiq in, in this regard of the month coming. Okay, so if we continue on now, we were looking at um, Suluk and Dawa. So we were looking at the idea of a well-rounded Muslim, a complete well-rounded Muslim, a Muslim who has attained a level of human perfection according to his abilities. He has fulfilled his potential. Yeah, a, a Muslim that has fulfilled the potential Allah Subhanahu wa Taala placed within him. What does this Muslim have? This Muslim is a person of knowledge. He's a person of suluk, of traveling to Allah, and he's a person of da'wah, of calling others to Allah. So we spoke about knowledge, the importance of understanding, memorizing, articulating knowledge. And then we spoke about suluk. So suluk, there's six qualities. The six qualities. Yeah, that we mentioned three of them, but we quickly recap. The first quality we mentioned was that the person of suluk is someone who attends lessons. He attends revision sessions of knowledge, and he makes the most of his time. Time management. Time management is, according to some, that last of Imam Ghazali, the foundation and the most important principle of the spiritual path is time management. Like he says, your life is your, your I mean, your life is time. It's these breaths. Yeah? These breaths that one, two, three, the passing, 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 that is time. So if you can perfect that, then, then you perfect everything else. Yeah. So we have this. I mean, the Ghazalian principle of time management, again, I would really recommend people that the book is written about this in his Ihya, in his litanies. But his principle of time management is to assign something to each period. What does that mean? So for example, we have, we have our day. So let's just say we have 
25 hours in a day, six of those hours we're going to sleep. Yeah, like Habib Omar mentions that we shouldn't sleep more than any, if you're sleeping any more than six hours is a problem. But let's just say we are sleeping eight hours, then we have 16 hours, whatever we have. Each hour of that day, or each half an hour, each 10, 15 minutes, we have an action assigned to it. Now, that doesn't, we might not be able to do the action at that time. So for example, I might have, um, you know, five o'clock to six o'clock, I'm going to read the Quran because it's been on the Jabal Isha. But at that time, something else comes up. That's fine. If something else comes up, you go and do that and you come back and you, re you return to it. But the point is you always have a priority of something you have to do at every particular time. Otherwise, it does become random, randomized. Yeah? So we have a particular, you know, seven till, like for example, if talking personally, uh, you know, like seven till eight for me is family time. Seven till eight in the evening is normally where I'm going to sit with the children and we, we're going to have time. The morning times now after this class is family time up until about nine, 10 o'clock. Yeah, we teach, uh, we spend time, we have breakfast together. You can, so you have time throughout your day when you are fulfilling everything within, within that and you have a dominant thing that you do. Yeah, and then beyond that, we have so that's one thing. Alongside that, we should also have a to do list. Mama Zalim mentions in the beginning of guidance that one of the things we should do after right now, actually, after Fajr prayer, is sit and make a list of he says, think about all possible good actions that you could do that day. Yeah, and and you know, mashallah, you know, intend them and then prioritize what are the main things I need to do today. Have 10, 15 things, whatever's on the list. Yeah, and then you work through that list. Yeah, alongside whatever you have. So for example, you might have two hours in the day, one till three in the afternoon, that's when I do everything on my to-do list. Because before Dhuhr, I'm busy. I've got my family that are busy in my dhikr or I'm busy in my work, whatever it is. But one till three, that's my to-do list time. Yeah? So, uh, three till five, I follow up on things that I missed in that time, et cetera, like that. Yeah, so we have that. There, there's a book that one of the brothers recommended to me. I haven't personally read it, but inshallah ta'ala, it's something that um, would be worth looking at. It's a book called 168. 168, it's like a modern take on time management, which is 168, 168 is the amount of hours we have in a week. Yeah, so it's teaching you how to plan a week. And I know, I mean, um, maybe Mona and Shah can mention something to us um, in the chat box, but I know Sheikh Omar Hussein Al Khatib has a book that's similar from what Mona and Shah told me many years ago in a conversation that he has a book where he tells you every day. Uh, throughout the week, what you should be should be doing at, at every every particular moment. So maybe if somebody could put that in the chat box, inshallah, the, the name of it, even if, it, if it's in Arabic, those who speak Arabic can benefit from it, inshallah. Yeah. So th this is this is important that, that we have, have have these to to do lists, and this really is a technique that has been mastered by all successful people. We look at these CEOs, these chairmen of corporations, etc. First of all, many of them sleep two hours a day. Yeah, they, don't, they really don't sleep a lot because they don't have time. None of them waste time watching TV. They'll watch TV maybe an hour a day or an hour a week. But what they are watching is 100% relevant to their job. It's very beneficial. Yeah, they don't waste time watching random stuff. They really don't. Yeah, they, they, because they're too busy doing what, whatever they want to do, which we, we have a sense of respect for that. Yeah, that they have himma in doing what they do. Yeah, they have him, even if it's wrong, we still have, have, have respect for that. Yeah, like they mentioned the famous story that our teachers mentioned about Imam Junaid. <laughs> Imam Junaid is walking past like a highway robber man, like a highway robber, somebody who's armed robbery, you'd say, in our day and age. And he's, he's, um, he's about to be hung or he's about to be punished. And Imam Junaid walks out and he gives him salams. And his students are around, they're shocked that you're giving salams to a man like that, like an open criminal. He said, I have respect, and this is a golden statement, we should remember this and in place it in our hearts. He said, I have respect for anyone who gives his life for what he desires. He gives his life for what he desires. And have we given our lives for what we desire, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Have we given our lives for what we yearn for, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Have we given our lives for what we long for? Have we or have we not? Are we those who have a shadu hubban lillah? We have a stronger love for Allah than the disbelievers have for their loves, their passions and their desires. Yeah, that kind of understanding is, is essential, essential to, to this path. Okay, so uh, we, we have this. The CEOs, the CEO, like I mentioned, they've they mastered this. And the final principle I want to mention here, the final secret in terms of time management is prioritization. That again, 
there's so many things in the day. There's so many things that we could be doing with our lives. So therefore we have to prioritize. And this again, this is the difference between success and failure. Look at the dominant, uh, and I always do this with students when you have like a workshop or we have an interactive session. I always ask them, who is the dominant power on, 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 on the face of the planet? Who, who is the most powerful power on the face of the planet? People will be like, oh, the government or I don't know, whatever, you know, people who are the conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff, you know. But the reality is there's no conspiracy theory. I'll let you know in a secret. There, there is no conspiracy. There's none of that's going on. I tell you who's in charge is the corporation. Yeah? And that's obvious. Money rules. The, khalas, that's it. And all the, they're not interested in um, Freemasonry. They're not interested in all this. They're just interested in making money and ruling the world. That's all they're interested in. And the, why is the corporation successful? One reason. And don't, this is, this is, this is from the Fakir, I, I I'm not an expert on corporate. This is what the corporations will tell you. This is what think tanks, this is what experts are telling you. The number one reason corporations are successful is they know how to prioritize. They are organized, they are planning, they have long-term planning, seven, 15, 20, 40, 50 years ahead. Now they mentioned some of them when they, when they established things like Google and YouTube, that they were planning 50 to 100 years ahead of time. When, when, they were, when they were planning these. And like, like we've mentioned, the Munafiq plans what he's going to eat for his next meal. And unfortunately, that's the state of many of us. That's as far as we go, isn't it? What's the, what, what am I going to eat for lunch? Or what am I eat for breakfast in this case? Yeah, that's as far as we're going. These people are planning. And it's the ability to like, in, in medical terms, they call it triaging, don't they? Yes, so one person who comes in with a headache, another person comes in with his arm severed. Who are you going to treat first? Obviously the person who's, you know, who's, who's, who's got his arm um, hanging off him. Yeah, this is a prioritization. This is what, 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 what we need to establish. And therefore, save, saving us a lot of time. How many discussions are we having about pointless things when people are, are losing their faith, when people are distant, they're disappointed with Islam. They're really disappointed with Muslims and they feel cynical and they feel completely disconnected from the religion. Yeah, and then we're having these refined debates about issues that really don't matter. They don't matter now, they, ne they never mattered in the past. Yeah, so this is prioritizing. Once you start to prioritize with that, and what's important in our lives, Allah comes number one. So therefore, our times of intimacy with Allah are number one. This is one thing you see from the great callers to God. The great callers to God, they don't prioritize a meeting. They actually prioritize Allah. So if they're having time with Allah, they cancel everything else. Yeah, sorry, you know, they, they, this isn't the, the time to be honest with you, it's the, this, this is not the time. This is the time for me to have intimate discourse with my Lord, not, not for this, yeah? So time management. Then we mentioned obviously guarding, guarding over the five salawat is the second one. Guarding over the salawat and praying in jama'ah, ah. which of course, this is our connection to Allah. Our connection to Allah, our sila with Allah comes from our salah, even linguistically it's linked. Our connection to the divine, which is the basis of all our other actions. That's the subject about the salah. So therefore, salah is, of course, principial. The third thing we have is precision in thinking and in choice of words. So, that, so, the, so the third thing that the well-rounded, the well-balanced Muslim should have is precision in thinking and in choice of words. In other words, he has hikmah. Yeah? So he, the level of success, there's two levels. The level of success is that only goodness is known to come from this person. Generally, he only speaks words of goodness. The level of uh, distinguishment or excellence is that he chooses the most powerful words that have the biggest impact on the heart. Yeah, so he has power of speech. And you see this, this like we mentioned before about asalib, different styles of speech. If you see the masters of speech, they have different styles. Like our teacher, Habib Umar, it's amazing. Like I think when I was in team, I counted maybe 15 or 20 different styles of speech. So like, for example, he has a, a, his Monday class on tafsir. That's very like Jalali. It's very majestic. And he's really like um, speaking out against kufr and speaking out against obstinacy and speaking out against falsehood. Yeah, so it's a very powerful verse. Then his class on Wednesdays, Yahya'amu'l-Mudin is a very intimate verse. It's, it's, it's a very loving verse. Yeah, it's a very soft and he's talking quietly and he's talking about love and he's talking about connection to the divine and it's martial, it's that. And then Thursday morning is like, Ya Allah. Yeah, it's just khitabi in the grace is directly connecting people back to Allah. Then you have the roha, his spirituality, this, which is a lot more informal. Yeah, he talks in an informal, and he talks in a way that's sort of, you know, for his students. 
Yeah. Then we have like he goes out when he goes out on his dawah trips. He'll go out to a, a Yemeni place. Completely, he's much more personable. He's, he's he's cracking jokes with them. He talks to them in a completely unrecognizable in a, in a completely different way. Then you have his class after Fajr, Ilmi. He's talking about knowledge. He's talking about the four schools of thought of fit, and it's a very technical verse, etc., yeah, etc., et like that. Yeah. So the, there's there's different styles, different ways in order to have the biggest impact on the nafs yeah, at that time. What's going to have the biggest impact and variety? So the nafs gets bored. So you need to speak in, in different ways at different times and to different people. Yeah. The fourth one then, that's the third one, precision in thinking towards the words. The fourth one is interactions and connections with others. In other words, our interactions and connections with everybody around us are positive. There's two aspects to this. The level of success is to ensure that our transactions are free from evil and deficiency. Yeah. So level of success is to ensure that what we do, our interactions, uh, there's no evil there, there's no evil intent, there's no evil done, there's no haram done, certainly, and there's no deficiency. Then what's the level of distinguishment of success, excellence? It is to have great respect for others and to honour them as much as we can. So the level of distinguishment, excellence, is to honour people, respect them as much as we are, okay, we are able to do. Well, I saw this with, with, with one of the... I, went, I, visited, I used to have lessons with a teacher in, in Blackburn. Um, one of the, the students actually of, of our teacher, Mawana Ishaq Hafadahullah. And one thing I know, I used to go to him for Arabic classes. And the way he would serve me was unbelievable. He would come in and he's like literally running around. And I'm the student. <laughs> I'm coming to him to learn. And he's serving me, he's honoring me. And I mean, that was very moving for the faqir, like, subhanAllah, that people, mashallah, there's still people that exist like this and on the face of the earth, but still have that sense of safa, purity. And they recognize where secrets of success lie. Yeah, the way the way he honors. So does mashallah somebody who understood that point. Mashallah. Number five is manifesting the effects of having ghayra for the deen. What's ghayra? Having like a jealousy for the deen, a jealous guarding of the deen. We have that, that we want to guard and protect the, this, this religion. Ghayra. Yeah. So again, this is essential that we have ghayra for the deen. We've lost this. Yeah, that people are openly committing haram before us. We don't even, the heart doesn't even feel any pain. Yeah, people are leaving wajibat. In our family, there's people that don't even pray and we don't feel any pain. It doesn't affect us. Yeah. So again, what's the level of success in this is that at least that if we see these things in these situations, we see haram being done, we see people leaving the great symbols of the religion, that it affects us. Yeah, affects us. Seeing something wrong like that affects us. There's some type of impact upon us. If there's no impact, then subhanAllah, yeah, we haven't achieved the, the level of success in this regard. The level of ex excellence or distinguishment is that we seek the biggest way to have an impact on, on, on other people. We seek a biggest way to have an impact on those people who have lost ghayra for the deen, who have lost protection, jealousy for the deen. Yeah, we do that and we, re alongside reflecting deeply over the most effective ways to deal with these issues. Yeah. So we look for the have the biggest impact and we have deep reflection. How can I impact this, this, this scenario, this situation? That's number five. Number six, the last one is manifesting the traces of love and ta'veem. Yeah. So showing, displaying the, the effects of love and honoring for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the Rasul, for the early, for the salaf, the early people, for the Quran and for all of the great symbols of, of, the, of the religion. All of them should, should be there. So the level of success is that at least these are, the traces of this are seen on the student. When he mentions the Prophet Sallallahu he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, there's, there's traces of this ta'adheem, of this honoring. The level of excellence is that this really appears in his actions and his conduct. Yeah, that this, this honoring and this love flows out from him. Yeah, so what, what does, I'll give you some examples, what does that mean? It means, for, first, for, for, for example, he frequently mentions the seerah. He frequently mentions the stories of the Sahaba, the Ahlul Bayt, yeah, the great scholars of the, he just, he frequently mentions this. So it's just, okay, mashallah, you know. And the manifestation of his inner reality become firmly established. Yeah, within his inner reality, he, he, he has this love and thought of So these are the qualities. And then just, just to finish today, the, we're just going to mention this because then we, we want to continue on in the next lesson on to different topics. 
is also da'wah. The level of a student in terms of da'wah. So how should the, or the Muslim, how should he be in terms of da'wah? So the first and foremost is that he has a great desire for da'wah. He places great importance on it. Yeah, he has, he has a great, great desire, which means on a basic level, it means that he mentions the importance of da'wah from time to time. And he goes out in the path of God, i.e. He's, he spends some time in his life engaged in call, calling people to Islam in whatever form that may be, and it's a varied, a, a, a varied form. The level of distinguishment in this regard is that he constantly makes mention of da'wah, and he's always concerned with issues concerning the Muslims. And he's also constantly and repeatedly calling people to Islam in all of his variants. He's constantly on this. He's constantly energizing, he's constantly doing this. Yeah, this is the first one. Yeah, someone who has a desire. Number two, someone who understands the vastness of da'wah. That is vast. It's not limited to a particular time or place. It's not limited to one type. Da'wah isn't just education. It's not just feeding the poor. It's not just engaging with young people. It's everything and anything. It's broad. Someone who understands that. So the level of success in this regard is that he talks about these things. He talks about da'wah being broad. And he, and he takes some of these techniques that he goes beyond one dimensional, maybe it's two or three dimensional. Yeah? The level of distinguishment, the level of distinguishment in this regard is that he uses many, many, many different means and therefore extends his benefit and his impact to as wide a range of people as possible. Yeah? And subhanAllah, listen to this, this is very important, inshallah. We try to be, inshallah, finish, finish on this point. He also seeks so this is very important. I really recommend people to listen and understand this point. Because if you can understand this point, then inshallah, the country we're in right now, the UK will become a Muslim country, inshallah. Really, if you can understand this point. He also seeks to invent new means and paths of da'wah. Yeah? He seeks to invent new means and paths of da'wah. As well as taking as much as he can from what, he's, what the teachers are saying, from what his teachers are saying, and from what he can see around him. Yeah, he contextualizes, he's constantly in a state of thought of how he can change based on the, the context that, that, that he's in. And he's seeking, in that, he's seeking invention, creativity. This is really what's needed. Like, um, I remember about 10, 15 years ago, Habib Ali Jiffy, he came to, to the UK and <coughs> he went to a gathering where people were like doing like a vicar, they were doing various different types of vicar and singing and nasheed and things like this. And he said, he said, if people saw this and they thought this was Islam, they would enter into Islam in large numbers. Yeah, so that's just one example. There's so many different ways that we need to be, be able to present this religion to people. And when you start to seek new means, you'll see people will respond. Now people respond and they'll start to see the relevance and, and the impact that, that Islam can, can, can have, have on their lives. So we have that. There's five, five more points, inshallah, but we'll, we'll save those for Saturday now, inshallah. So tomorrow, obviously, is, um, is, is a break, is, a, is, a, is the day off, inshallah. And there, there is some other points that are also very important, to be honest, that, 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 that do need to be mentioned and do need to be, be considered as well, so inshallah. So we can finish, finish off on those points as well, inshallah. If there's any questions, um, inshallah, please leave your, your, your comments, or you can, um, of course, unmute your mic and speak, marhaban. Um, yeah, the book has been shared, and the, uh, so this, this is the book. We're on page page tw twenty four of, of the book, inshallah. Um, so if, there, if there's any any questions um, from from anybody, inshallah, then please. Um, I had a question. Do you know with regards to somebody who's well involved in uh, da'wah work, teaching, etc., projects in the community? How what's the best way to manage that as well as? Um, someone who's uh, trying to manage uh, helping their own family as well in terms of keeping away from sin and guarding their religion. Excellent. Very, very good question. Very good question. So the key here, I would say, is baraka. So I'll give you an example. Like um, one of the sisters they asked Habib Umar the same, like a similar question. They said, um, obviously, as women, we are, we are encouraged to call people to Islam, especially in the West. You know, like women need to be, be engaged, of course. But at the same time, we also ha have, a, have our family responsibilities. So what do we do? So what Habib said is, again, you're pushing a time for dealing with your family duties. 
But this also obviously applies to the fathers and, 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 and the men of our ummah as well. You have a time you portion, and then you have other times that you apportion to um, calling people to Islam. So if you look at the, the way that, that is done in Tadim, for example, the morning time, breakfast time is a time for the, for the family. Uh, lunch time is a time for the family between Dhuhr and Asr. And then evening time, you know, like before bed, after Isha is a time for the family. So therefore you are engaging with your family three times, three significant times a day. And that time is quality undivided. We know now, like in America, the average parent, I mean, this, just listen to, to this stat. When I heard this, I nearly, I nearly fell off my chair before I sat down. Um, uh, the average American parent gives 25 minutes 25 minutes of undivided attention to his child in a week. <laughs> this, 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 25 minutes in a week. That's a four, less than four minutes a day. Yeah, and then in the UK, this is about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Undivided, no phone, no looking over there, no distraction, undivided attention to my child. So if you look at this now, what, what does Habib Omar do? He has, he, go, he returns back home after his schedule this. He has one hour where he teaches his daughters. Then he has another hour where he teaches his granddaughters. Yeah? So this is him giving concern to, to the female members of his household. Then he makes breakfast for his family. He makes breakfast for his family. Yeah? And then he sits with his family. He has, he has time with them. Yeah? That's it. And then between, between lunch and, sorry, the lunch time between Dhuhr and Asad, it's generally time for guests. So sometimes a man will be, but most people, 95% of people in Tirim, that's a time when they really are with their families, focus 100%. And then before you go to sleep. So if you can establish that you have that. And then but what Habib Umar said, he said that if you are sincere, then Allah will open up portals of time. It's amazing how much you can do when Allah places barakah in your time. And you see that you go to the Muslim lands, the Fakir, we, we were living in Fez. We were in the new city of Fez. And I was amazed by the barakah in my time. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Then we moved to the old city. In the old city, by Allah, what I would do in one week, I was doing in, in one day in the old city of Fez because of the barakah of that place. Then we, the Fakir, we moved to Tareem. In Tareem, what I was doing on one day, I would do in one month. How? So now you come back and you're back to chase, chasing your own tail and you're thinking, where, where's the time going? So it's upon us to place barakah within our time for you to be, to be able to expand. And therefore, we're then able to fulfill all of, of our duties because they're all necessary. Because even your own family, this is one of the secrets that we have to understand is if you don't reach out to other people, it's going to come to our doorstep. It's going to destroy our family and our household, guaranteed. Yeah, if you don't reach out, if you don't command to go to forbid, even in our wider society and circles, it's going to end up affecting our own family anyway. So we've got no choice. Even, even, even if we just want to protect our family, we still have to be out there um, try, trying to save and change others. Yeah, and also that's how we become the example for what we want for our children and for our spouses and for our siblings and our parents. We want them to become people who call others to Islam. We want them to become people of, of Muhammadan elevation. So lead by example and they'll follow. Yeah, so all, all of the, these things, these, these are, so I hope that's answered the question, inshallah. Um, but these are all, you know, important. Okay, so the next question. Many people have had and are having marital issues as a result of perhaps over-engaging in the da'wah. Any ad advice would be appreciated. Yeah, so again, this is the same point. This is the, the point of balance. And this is also a point of rearing and recognizing where we are with our, with our spouses. That one of the mistakes people make is that your wife or your husband is not a dawah project. They really, they're not a dawah project. You, you got married, you have what you have. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, so if you have a wife that's very understanding or you have a husband that's very understanding, he's really encouraging, you to go out and do a lot of work. And mashallah, if you have a wife who isn't so understanding, then you have to accept that that is your reality, that that is the situation that you have now been placed in. We don't impose that. Just as Zuhud, you know, the idea of radical poverty and simplicity, we don't impose that upon, upon our family, impose it upon our own selves. We let go of the dunya. But we don't expect our family to then live in, that, you know, an, in, in absolute poverty, in a one-bedroom house with you know, two, one meal every three days. That's what we impose upon our own selves. Yeah, if we have the himma, we build up to that, don't we? But you don't, but the same thing with this, that we, you don't, you don't therefore impose that. But at the same time, there has to be a recognition of, of fulfilling of rights. The key point really here is, is about quality, not quantity of time. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Look at the research now. The average person 
has, has 2,175 swipes. That's what I mean, swipes of their phone every day. 2,175 swipes of their phone. Where's the quality of the time? You sat with your family, or you know, I spent an hour there with, with my wife. Why is she not happy for? Because you've been on your phone like this, doing, I don't know, 500 swipes in the hour. You know, or, or whatever. That's number, number two, the average person, this is in the States, although I don't know about here, the average person spends six hours a day on entertainment on their phone, not work, entertainment on their phone. Here, maybe I think it's about three or four hours I need each other to start, something like that. I remember reading maybe a month ago. Yeah. So these are the things we need to be aware of. Yeah, it's an obligation to be aware of the age that, that you're living in. So be aware of this is where the problems lie. It's not in, oh, I don't have enough time. The time is there, the barakah is there, but we don't. Like you look at, mashallah, look at um, some of Umar, he doesn't have a phone. The only time you see him that maybe he has one portion in his, in his whole day where he checks his phone and, and responds to his messages. Yeah, some of, of our other well-known teachers in the West, they don't have phones. They really don't. You can't get hold of them directly. You go through their PA and they have three or four secretaries who do their work for them. Yeah, they don't waste time on their phone. And they're great callers to God. You don't need to be on your phone all the time to call people to Islam. You really don't. Yeah, so if you can eliminate that, that the Sahaba, one, one of the scholars he was asked, he said that, how did the Sahaba do so much Quran? How were they so connected to the Quran in a powerful way? He said, because, listen to this, take this as an Ibra. He said, he, they gazed upon the Mus'haf. They engaged with the Mus'haf just that you engage with your phone. It's exactly the same. Just like you engage with your phone, engage, and so because sometimes we feel like it's impossible to be like this. How did they read the full khatam of the Quran in a day? It's no, it's not actually because if you transferred all of your time on your phone to the Quran, you would probably be able to outstrip the Sahaba. <laughs> really, you would. Yeah, you would be. You would be able to outstrip the Sahaba in <laughs> worship of, of Allah and in the recitation of the Quran. Yeah, mashallah. Uh, another question: What are some ways we can give dawah in these times in lockdown? Um, this is one of the means <laughs> that we're taking right now, which is obviously Zoom or like you know, the internet. Um, the other things that, that we can do, the fundamental nature of da'wah is 80% of it is calling upon Allah. So what we can do is we can get up in the depths of the night and we can call upon Allah with, with sincerity. Sheikh Umar Hussein al-Khatib, he said to us that he said there's stages of da'wah. So he said, you should come back and you should go out into different towns and call, call people to Islam. Because if you can't do that, there's no response. People aren't, don't want you to come to that town. You're not getting invites. Then go to your local masjid and start working there. If your local masjid doesn't want you, the committee is not happy with you, then go to a, your local community center and work there. If your local community center doesn't want you, then go to your house and establish lessons in your house, establish activities, gatherings in your house. If people in your house, no one's coming, then close your doors and say, Ya Allah, make me a means of good. Ya Allah, open up doors for me to be able to call people to Islam and to be able to, to benefit the Ummah. Yeah? So there's always something that, that, that we can do. So within this lockdown, there, there's great opportunities. And really, it's about our own per perception. Because Allah is in control. He's in absolute control of everything. And therefore, we can create change in any context, any situation. We know people. Look at um, the people in Central Asia. Our great scholars from like, you know, these places in Central Asia. Yeah, they lived in the communist rule for how many years? If you stepped out, uh, at, uh, if you stepped into a, someone, a scholar's house, you'd be killed if they found you. You couldn't pray openly. You couldn't eat halal meat. And yet they maintained Islam in that context. They maintained Islamic knowledge. The people of Yemen when, in the 60s and the 70s when the communists came, they used to have like, Habib Masakaf, after the whole how well, he used to play football and he used to have his books hidden under him and then he used to go on. That's how he used to take his durus. Because, oh, I'm just playing football. Like, okay, you can do that. We're not going to let you learn, but we let you play football. And then he's going in and he's getting his durus. Like so people in any context and situation are able to propagate, learn the religion and spread, spread the, 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 the religion. Yeah, so whatever context we're in, we take means and Allah opens up doors. And inshallah, we, inshallah this lockdown will be over soon. Inshallah, I'll be very optimistic that it will be over soon. Inshallah, we can return back to a fuller, engagement with with human beings but it's failing that we still, and in many ways the lockdown is also a great opportunity um especially if you could just get rid of the internet then it really would be because what the lockdown has done is allowed people a chance for real change and most people they're not willing to let go of the things that really will change. Like for example work people are so busy with work they're so busy with other people now people have been forced to go away from from other people they've been forced to reduce their work hours Many people have lost their jobs and their businesses and everything. 
So as a result, there's a much stronger vijihah to Allah, a much stronger focus upon Allah. People have had a chance for reflection and to be able to be alone with Allah. Yeah, they have this opposite. So there's a, there's a greater ragba. Now what's unfortunately destroying that is what we're seeing like in terms of like, I don't know, you know, um, Netflix and the rest of it. So inshallah ta'ala, you know, just make the wa'ad that maybe the internet can also go down as well, inshallah. Um, and then we can actually become people that, you know, really are, 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 are able, able to establish. All right, okay. Uh, this is a book, uh, to Shea um, Fomer's book. Um, it's been doing it on a WhatsApp image. Unfortunately, the Fafi is not really good technologically, so I'm just going to try to, but yeah, um, this, this image I'm, I'm, get, I'm guessing is the book, inshallah. So if, uh, if people want to get this book, then they, 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 they can get this book, inshallah. inshallah. If there's any other questions, we can take them. If not, we can stop there. Okay, Zakhmullah. Just a reminder, there's the morning tonight, inshallah, 730 so it will be 7.30 through to, to, through to 9 o'clock, inshallah. So we'll recite the, 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 the mawlid and then we'll have some shawn nasiha and then also a very important lesson from our honorary teacher, Mawlana Aishad, uh, Hafidahullah. He's going to do a lesson for us on uh, the shamail, on the character traits of the Prophet. So we're we'll looking at his blessed character. So inshallah, it could be the first of Rajab, could be one of the nights of acceptance. And what a great way to begin the month, month, month of Rajab in the dhikr of the Rasul, inshallah. وصلى الله تعالى على سيدنا محمد وعلى 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 محم